Everybody say, Amen. Father, we thank you for bringing us together so we can learn at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that what we hear will not pass it over the shoulder to the people behind us, beside us, or around us. We pray, Lord, will accept your word as if you were speaking to us directly in Jesus' name. And let your word bear fruit in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. A good, good amen. An amen that you wake up somebody sleeping by your side. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Luke chapter 15 tonight. And we're looking at verses 11 to 24. Look at this in Luke chapter 15 verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons. You know, the Lord was giving a parable. A parable to show that God has ownership of every life. Even the people that do not uh, accept Christ, God is the creator and God is the, he has the fatherhood on everyone. And so when Jesus said that a man had two sons, he's, he's referring to God. He has two sons. Some are, are righteous, the others are only religious, two types of sons. Some are going the right direction. The others are going the negative direction, two kinds of sons. Some are sincere and they're serving the Lord. Others are hypocritical, they are not serving the Lord. He has two kinds of sons. It tells us in verse 12. In verse 12 it says, And the younger of them said, to his father, father, give me the a portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Look at verse 13. In verse 13 it says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey unto a far country. Notice that, a far country. He wanted to be far from the father so that he will be alone. He will not have any kind of supervision over him. He was looking for number one, freedom. He was looking for number two, independence. And that is how many people are in our world. They want freedom, freedom from control, freedom from correction, freedom from the commandments of God, freedom to live the way they want to live. They want independence. And so he took everything he had and he went to a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. We're looking at verse 14. It says in verse 14, and when he had spent all, and there comes a time when somebody wastes his brain. He wastes his strength. He wastes everything that he has and now he becomes sick. It becomes anemic. He doesn't know what, is, what life is going to be for him because all the natural talents, all the natural gifts, and all the natural strength, the Lord had given him everything has been wasted away. And it says there arose a mighty famine in that land, and it began to be in want. In verse 15, it tells us, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Remember, far country. And in that far country, those people in the far country, they had a different lifestyle than the Jewish people. He was a Jew and he came from the land of promise and he went to the far country. In that far country now, he had a citizen that he joined himself with in that far country and he sent him, that is, that sent him into the fields to feed swine. Looking at the next verse here, in verse 16, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks 
that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Then verse 17, verse 17, and when he came to himself, it was like he was out of himself. It was beside himself. It was mad, insane. The people who do things they ought not to do, they are out of their mind. They are out of their a real place they ought to be. And because they are mad, they are insane, they are being controlled by another power, another spirit out of themselves. They are not in control. But now, because of the hunger, he came to himself. And there are times when if you help a man that is hungry, it's good to help hungry people. But there are hungry people that only the hunger will make them come back to themselves. And so we have to be very prayerful. Is this a prodigal son? Is that a prodigal daughter? That it is the pressure of the hunger, of the famine, that will make him to come to himself, make him come back to his senses and say, what am I doing here? Why have I gone this way? Why am I, have I gone that way? A person that is running away from God, running away from control, running away from the scriptures, running away from his birthright. Sometimes when they come into hunger, they come into penury, they come into poverty, they come into famine, and then you are there, you never pray, you never think, why is this man in this condition? Why is this woman in this condition? Once uh, we see anybody that is hungry, feed him, feed him, feed him. Let us understand everything we're learning in the scripture. He said, how many? Hired servants of my father's, that is of my father's house, have bread enough to eat, and I perish with hunger in this place. He tells us now in verse 18, he said, I will arise. Now, hunger, hunger preached to him. The famine preached to him. The penury that he got into brought him to repentance and made him to wake up. Why are you here? You, the son of a good father, of a rich father, of a prosperous father, here you are. What are you doing here? And what the father could not tell him or far apart and watch no other friend fair weather friends could tell him those who were not serious they were hypocritical his so heart now told him because of the hunger he said i will arise and go to my father and i will say unto him hunger taught him how to pray the mighty famine taught him how to pray. It's the mighty famine that took him away from the throne of pride and brought him on his knees in his mind. And he said, I will say, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. No preacher there, no preacher could have told him what the hunger forced him to realize. Many times in our lives, if the problems we have, many times in our lives, if the famine we have, many times in our lives, if the penury, the poverty we bring ourselves to, that will preach the greatest message we ever respond to. He said, I've seen. He didn't only say, I will arise. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, and I am no more worthy. You know, he used to think, give me what I am worth. The goods that belong to me. And I'm worthy to have that. And the Jewish fathers, they had a law at that time. If they had two sons, they'll give two thirds to the elder. They'll give one third to the junior to the uh, to the younger one and he said that's my right i am worthy to have this and he got what he was worthy to have he wasted everything but now i am not worthy to even be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants look at verse 20 in verse 20 and he arose i will arise that's intention 
That's plan. I will. It's not done it or thinking about it. Many people, uh, when they hear the message of the word of God, I will. I will change. I will turn around. I will arise. I will go. And I'm suffering here. I will. When the message catches them, and when they are sorrowful, I will. They only have intention. They don't take action. It is when your action matches your intention that I mean business. I will not stay here another moment. And so he brought action to his intention. And he came up and he arose and came to his father. How will I know the way back to the father? The way you took when you are going away. Is the way you take when you are coming back to the Father. How do you know the way back to the love of God, back to the grace of God, back to the goodness of God? The way you took in going away the prayerlessness, the way you took the bold face that you took, all the past you take in going away is the way you now take as you are coming back. He knew the way. You know the way. If you are going to be saved, you know the way. Sanctified, you know the way. If you are going to be filled with the power of God and with the commitment, consecration you had in the past, the way that took you far away is the way you take and you come back and he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way up, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. We know this story. Now we're looking at the message, the fall and the rise of the prodigal son. The fall, he fell. But he didn't remain in that condition, the fall and the rise of the prodigal son. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the regrettable freedom and independence of the prodigal son. Would you remember your personal life? Because, you know, the temptation comes to everyone. We're seeing that, you know, being under the control, of God, the control of the scriptures, the control of the pastor, the control of the preacher, the control of a father, the control of a mother, the control of a husband, the control of a personality that God has brought us into. We think the control is too heavy. I need freedom. Think before you leave and understand what the Lord is teaching us before you jump into a far country. And the independence, I want to be independent. I don't want to hear any kind of instruction from anyone. Think before you act. Number one is the regrettable freedom and independence of the prodigal son. Point number two is the reckless forwardness and indifference of of the prodigal shepherds. You know, when the Lord told the uh, parable, which becomes a story, it's applicable to many, many lives. There were shepherds, there were kings, there were princes that made themselves like prodigal sons. Number three, the remarkable of a uh, remarkable fervency and inheritance of proactive servants. We're coming to point number one. Point number one, we're looking at the regrettable freedom and independence of the prodigal son. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one is the fatal freedom of the prodigal son. Number two is the fierce famine on the persistent scoffer. Number three is the forbidding food of the polluted swine and with the polluted swine. Look at number one there. Number one is the fatal freedom of prodigals of the prodigal son. You know, freedom that hurts us. Freedom that makes us regret. You wanted freedom and God said, okay, you want to go that way, you can go. Ephraim has chosen to serve idols. 
let him go. And the, that freedom becomes fatal. That after you have gone to that far country, after you have chosen your way, and you are now there, and you say, I thought freedom is sweet. This one is bitter. I thought independence is enjoyable. This one, this independence will kill the man, will kill that woman, will kill that child. It is fatal. That kind of freedom, it is fatal. That kind of independence that the prodigal son wanted to have. He had it, but he didn't enjoy it. Look at Psalm 10. We're reading from verse 4. In Psalm 10, verse 4, the wicked, through, his, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Freedom from God. Independence from God. Look at chapter 12 of the Psalms. We're looking at verse 4. Chapter 12, verse 4. Who, are, who have said with our tongue we will prevail. And then it says our lives are our own. And who is Lord over us. That the freedom that's fatal. That's the independence, and that is fatal. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 2, reading from verse 13. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken, the, uh, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have huge for themselves, they have healed them out, sisters, broken sisters that can hold no water. Look at verse 31, 13, then 31. In verse 31, O oh generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land for a land of darkness, and where for say, say my people, we are lords, we are lords over ourselves. I'm old enough now to take decision on whatever I want to do, wherever I want to go, wherever I want to marry. I'm old enough now to think about a man that has come to 25 years of age, 27 years of age, 30 years of age. Think of a lady that has come to, uh, you know, 32, 33, and they say, pray, pray, know the will of God. I think, you know, we're emphasizing too much dependence on God, reliance on God. And looking at the scriptures, I, I know what I want. I know what I want my future to be. They want freedom. They want independence. And they don't want anyone to tell them, have you prayed? Have you sought the face of the Lord? Uh, you know, some people, they want to get away from somewhere. They want to get away from the country. They want to get away from, you know, the job they're doing. They think that's not, it doesn't befit my status. They want to get away even from their home. They want to separate. They want to divorce. And you say, have you thought, have you prayed, have you read the Bible? He <laughs> said, please, get out of my way. I'm old enough now. There are people like that, and they don't understand that freedom can be fatal. They don't understand that that kind of independence can be fatal. Wherefore, say, my people, we are lords. We will come no more unto thee. Let's look at number two here. Number two here, we're looking at the fierce famine on the persistent scoffer. And maybe the thought came to the prodigal son, won't you go back home? Don't tell me that. That's the devil telling me that I got my freedom. And it took me boldness to be able to shake myself from that home and from that father. And therefore, he will scoff any idea that will say, reconsider. Won't you go back home? Don't tell me that. Won't you go back under the leadership of such a father that you have? Don't tell me that. They scoffed at the possibility of returning back home. And these persistent scoffers, 
eventually a fierce famine comes upon them well you know they were ready to ready how a mighty famine came up in the far country where this child was we're looking at ezekiel chapter 14 ezekiel chapter 14 we're reading from verse 13 it says son of man when the land uh, when the land sinneth against me by uh, the by despising uh, by despising grievously it says then will i stretch out my hand uh, upon it and will break the staff of bread against that country against that land thereof and it says and i will send i will send i will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it it says it's coming from the lord uh, you know sometimes uh, anything that appears negative that happens we say this uh, the devil here this is an evil spirit here and these are you know those people they're trying to get at me they're trying to destroy me god says no that is the one that sent the famine upon uh, the prodigal son god how can you do that i do that because i want to bring him back i do that because filling him up and stop giving him stuff and he's filled up with everything he was he will not repent he'll not turn and if if he dies in the far country he will perish forever he will go to hell but i want him i created him for myself that he will have fellowship with me therefore in that far country the, he will be so hungry it will come to penury and the hunger will bring him back so god said i will send famine upon him uh, how many times uh, we with our human kindness how many times we're blind eyes were blind we don't know how god is dealing with that man how god is dealing with that woman and we're too quick would you have this we'll even deny ourselves and we will say jesus said do good true true very true but the good the best thing we can do in doing good is to pull somebody out of the far country and lead him back to the promised land now so god said it's me it's me i will send famine upon it look at verse 14 in verse 14 it says though these three men noah daniel and job were in it good natured people faithful people the people that had power with god though they were there he said they should deliver but themselves their own souls by their righteousness and by their prayer says the lord god what do you think sometimes an evangelist a preacher a pastor somebody who has real faith he prays for this one the problem is gone he prays for that one the problem is gone he prays for Gehazi and he says Lord heal him Lord heal him and Gehazi is not saying this is what I did why leprosy came upon him Gehazi is not saying actually this one is not natural this one is not biological this one is not scientific this one is spiritual I ran at a name and and when I got there, I got this and that. And Elisha asked me, was my master, and said, where have you been? I said, I went nowhere. I didn't go anywhere. And he says, did it I see did my eyes follow you? And this leprosy came upon him. And the as I now as heard of a man of God that prays, and he never misses it. And he goes, and the fellow prays and prays and prays, and nothing happened. 
your hands right. Why didn't you tell the person praying for you, your wage as far as the far country, and your God that man, this is what your God, and now your God leprosy. And we who are praying, 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 and we pray, somebody gets into trouble, he had committed himself to the Lord. He had consecrated himself to the, and said, Lord, this is what I will do. I will follow you. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ forever. No turning back. No turning back. And now he's turned back. And the Lord is using what is happening now to bring him back to himself. And we're quick to pray. We're quick to give. We're quick to do whatever. Uh, this is what the Lord is saying. Uh, that even if Job, even if Daniel, even if Noah will pray for this nation that he will not answer it will only themselves will they say by the righteousness why because he wants them back he's still going to send another prophet beyond ezekiel and he will say come back come back my people have been lost sheep and he wants them to come back we need to have understanding and insight as to as we read the word of God. Hey, look at Amos chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 11. Amos chapter 8 verse 11. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. I, I, I will send a famine in the land. And then it says, not a famine of bread, no, it thirsts for water, but of hearing the, the, the words of the Lord. And then in verse 12, verse 12 says, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north, from the north, even to the east, that they shall run to and fro to seek the words of the Lord, and shall not find it. The spiritual famine. There is natural famine. There is spiritual hunger. And there is natural hunger. There is joblessness that in the commercial section, it's like there is famine. There is also the spiritual blindness. Uh, they carry the Bible. They read. They cannot understand. And then it says in Second Chronicles chapter 7, reading from verse 13, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13, it says, if I shut up heaven, I, this God talking, if I shut up heaven, you know many people that attribute, if there's no rain, the devil is up to something. If uh, there is no harvest, the devil is up to something. If we don't have food, if the harvest is not yielding normally and properly, we attribute everything to the devil. God said, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain and uh, no, or if I command, I command the locals to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Now, if those people were stable, steadfast, serving the Lord, He'll not send such a thing to them. If they were loving and loyal unto the Lord, He'll not send the famine unto them, but because they go astray because they go to the far country and this now happens to them if i do that to my people look at verse 13 verse 14 in verse 14 if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves you know what he said job may pray for them i won't answer daniel may pray for them i won't answer Noah, we pray for them. Their righteousness will not save these people. But if they themselves, 
If they come to the realization, God says, that's what I'm waiting for. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm not waiting that you know, they'll get somebody to build them out. And then they continue in their sin. They continue in the far country. But if my people, which are called by my name, if they themselves will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. They say, that's what I'm looking for. That prodigal son must come to himself. He must say, I will arise and go. And he must actually do it and back his intention with his action. He says, if they will turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let's come to a point number three here. Number three, we're looking at... Um, the forbidden food with the polluted swine. The polluted uh, of the swine and with the swine. Here is uh, this uh, prodigal son now. He was still standing on, uh, I have my freedom. I claim my freedom. I'm going to enjoy my freedom. I'm, I'm come this far and it's not the time to think of going back to the father's house and he was stubborn in his rebellion he had gone away from the lord and now he joined himself to a citizen of the land as he joined himself there they sent him to go and do the forbidden thing do you remember that the swine the pig was unclean to the children of israel and it says in the Old Testament, uh, well, under which they live, that if a pig is swine, if he dies, to even touch that dead swine makes you unclean. Now, this young man, the prodigal son, is there, and the famine was biting hard on him, and he went to feed swine. Think about what we will not do normally when we are at home. When we're the father, when we are with the protector, the protection that God has given us, a pastor, even myself now as a pastor, the church is my protection. The family is my protection. I say my people are there, the saints of God are there, the children of God are there. There are things, normally there are things I will not do, even if the people are not there, but more so that I have the brethren all around me there are things the brethren around you they protect you from the wife you have protects you from the husband you have protects you from and the people who are watching over you as they that must give account they protect you from but when you say what's about this i think i like some freedom I think I like some fresh hair. I don't think I want all these people looking over my shoulder. Where did you go? What are you doing? What are you reading? What are you not reading? And then you are like that. When you get to the far country, there are things nobody will even tell you to do at home. Nobody will put any pressure on you and push you into. You will do, unfortunately, and reluctantly what you would not have done and so we're told in verse 15 of Luke chapter 15 it says and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine and you see the condition of service was not all right no argument even to have a place to lay his head where the swine also slept. Even that, even that. And now the food, he couldn't ask. The husks, the food that the swine ate, nobody gave it to him. It was as bad as that. And when he got to the rock bottom, when he got to that lowest stage, he said, I think I have to do something. The shame 
of going back to the Father, I think I have to forget all about that. Uh, let, let's look at Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we're looking at verse 11. It says, Now there was there, uh, there was there near unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding and we're told in verse 12 in verse 12 it says and all the devils besought him saying send us into the swine that we may enter into them it is the favorable home of uh, demons of evil spirits swine and the swine the, the evil spirit said well, if you are casting us out of this man, cast us into the swine. And these are the creatures that this runaway son that he was taking care of. And it says in verse 13, in verse 13 it says, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave and uh, the unclean spirits pig swine unclean and then the spirits that entered into them unclean and this unfortunate young man has to take care of the unclean swine that could ingest that could swallow that could be possessed by unclean spirit and then it says and they heard that the, all that uh, all the pigs and the swine they ran violently down the down the down the steep and it says the steep place into the sea and it says they were about two thousand and they were choked in the sea look at the first part of verse 14 in verse 14 it says and they that fled the swine fled uh, you know the the work the man even got was cannot be totally stable because if anything happens and those evil spirits came uh, they were you know, as they perished the people feeding them uh, they were on now there are people that Jesus referred to as swine. It says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, it says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. I was talking about people. He said, Some are like dogs, others are like swine. And then he said, Lest they trample them under and under their feet and turn again and rend you. And the pigs don't uh, know how to say thank you, how to respect, how to honor here. You're a child of God, you're staying at home. You're not like the younger son that have run away. The people who run away, sometimes uh, they can run into a religious assembly. And he tells them, okay, take care of those people there. Those thankless people. And those people, you cannot even give them holy things. You want to prove that, you know, I'm coming from deep and life. And you get there. Deep and life is for holiness. And they give you a chance to, you know, take care of those people. And begin to give holy things unto the dogs and the swine. They say, what is this? What kind of person has our overseer giving us here? We don't want that. They'll turn around and rend you. Over here, we'll say, praise the Lord. You're doing well, brother. You're doing well, sister. We appreciate your service. We appreciate the good thing you're doing. You're bringing people from their sin to the Savior. Thank you. Do more of that over there when they tell you to take care of the swine. There's no, thank, there's no thankfulness over there. He tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 22. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 22. It says, but it has happened unto them uh, according to the true proverb. The dog is turned back 
to his vomit. How about that? You labor and labor over there in the far country. And the people you are laboring on, all of them, all of them, they turn back to their vomit. And it says, and the soul that was washed, the swine, the pig that was washed, and, uh, you know, went to her, to, uh, to a wallowing in the mire. Uh, so it is labor that is lost, not rewardable, except the prodigal son comes back. You will not die in the far country. You will not even go into the far country. The freedom we have here, freedom from sin, the freedom we have here, freedom to express ourselves, the freedom we have here, freedom to do the work and the will of God, that freedom will remain permanent with you in Jesus' name. And the independence we have, don't you have independence? Of course you have independence. Are we taking a whip and running after you and whooping you? Not at all. And you have the freedom the independence to read the Bible by yourself. The independence uh, that you have to pick the message on the, on the internet, on the website. You have the independence to pray. You have the independence to fast. And if there is anything of concern to you, you have the independence to come and ask our pastors, our group pastors, our local uh, you know, church leaders, our women leaders, and everyone. You have the independence. We are here to serve you the independence we have here I pray you'll never lose it in Jesus name and you know you have the independence there to preach the word of God and when you preach you open that Bible and you tell us things deep in the word and there's nobody going to challenge you why did you preach it like that and if you are leading us in prayer you have the independence the independence we have here you'll never lose it in Jesus name but the faith Fatal freedom, the fatal independence that people run after, and they cannot tell you enough what they are suffering because of the choice they have made. The Lord has put you here. You remain under the umbrella of the Almighty till you go to see Jesus face to face in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at the reckless forwardness and indifference of prodigal shepherds prodigal sh there are three things we're looking at look at number one number one the failure and the fall of prodigal princes number two is the folly and full hardiness of a prodigal prophet number three is the faithlessness and the faith of prodigal people look at number one when jesus told the parable of the prodigal son was not just a one person was talking about different people the prodigal prince the prodigal prophet the prodigal people. Number one is the failure and the fall of prodigal princes. We're looking at First Kings chapter 11, reading from verses 1 and 2. It says, But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh's of Pharaoh. And it says, Women of the Moabites, of the Amorites, of the Edomites, and of the um, Zidonians and the Hittites. It went into the far country. You see, going into the far country, you can go into the far country with your mind. You can go to the far country. Your, your body is here. Your flesh is over there. It's gone to the far country with his flesh. You can go to the far country with your emotion, with your mind, with your desire, with the defilement that you want. And so Solomon went into the far country. And he got all this. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, And uh, of the nations uh, uh, concerning which the Lord had said, unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go to them. And it says, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely 
day will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. That's a prodigal king, a prodigal prince. We're looking at a verse. We're looking at a verse four. In verse four, it tells us, "For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods." Dangerous. And when somebody is old, about to get to the grave, about to leave the world, about to go and give records of what he has done, where he has been, how he has treated the word of God or the commandment of God at such a time when he was old, those wives made him to turn his heart away from God. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Uh, look there at verse, um, uh, at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, and then Sol Solomon, then did Solomon build an high place for Jemosh, the abomination of Moab, and in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and it says, for and for Molech, and for the and the abomination of the children of Ammon. Look at verse eight. In verse eight, it says, and likewise did he Solomon for all his strange wives. He had seven hundred strange wives no lady no woman in israel that he could marry solomon you see that's a prodigal king that's a prodigal prince and it says he did this for all he all the wives which burnt incense and uh, sacrifice unto their gods can you think of you know the king of israel I mean, all those strange wives, by the way, by the way, what did the elders and the leaders of Israel do? Did they confront Solomon? No. That man had the wisdom that ruined him. The wisdom that sheltered him from anybody's counsel. The wisdom that protected him from anybody's approach. There are people like that. That's fatal wisdom. Fatal wisdom. And watch, if you read the whole story of Solomon, wisdom corrupted him. Women destroyed him. Wine destroyed him. Wealth destroyed him. A man that has all those opportunities, but he became a prodigal king. Uh, look at look at verse nine. In verse nine, we're told, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. In First Chronicles chapter ten, reading from verse. 13, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord. He committed against the Lord. Remember, remember how humble the man was at the time when he was to be made king. They were looking for him. Where is the man? Where is the man? He went to hide himself with the storm. But now he's gone spiritually to the far country. And then he said, I did that because I feared the people. Uh, you know, sometimes you can run to the far country because you fear 
the people. I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But now you have some challenges, you know, as you are coming in. I don't like the way that person looked at me. I don't like the way that person spoke to me. I don't like that preaching they preached at that time. And they were even pointing to me. I normally point, but if I point at you, it's the Holy Ghost pointing at you. Give me good, good, amen. I don't like this. I don't like that. And I fear the people. I fear the pastor. I fear the people. I fear the women. I fear, you know, those young people. I fear them, the way they are acting to me now. And fear can make you to run. Run to a far country. And when you get over there, we're asking you, why did you go to that far country? Uh, because I fear the people. Who are the people? Uh, the people. Uh, name somebody. I don't know any name. I just fear them. And they, even the pastor. Name the pastor. Is it, uh, you know, the GS? Uh, I cannot tell. I just know I feared everybody. And because of the fear you run, you will not run. I'm telling you, there are preachers, even pastors, local church pastors, or pastors in the state, pastors anywhere, and there's something that happens to them, and because they're not confident, they're not happy, they run. There's nowhere to run to. The Lord has brought you to the promised land. You will stay. You'll abide in the promised land in Jesus' name. And so, because I fear the people, and eventually he couldn't pray, Saul. And eventually he went to the witch of Endor, and the things he had cancelled before, and the people, the things he had destroyed before, he raised them up again. And the Bible says, because he kept not the watch of the Lord, and also for seeking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. The problem is there are kings, there are princes that go to the far country. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 25. In Second Chronicles chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. A king in Jerusalem, a prince in Jerusalem, and his uh, mother's name was um, Jehoiada Jehoiada of Jerusalem. Look at verse two. In verse two, it says, "And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with." A perfect heart. In the New Testament language, we'll say he was saved, but not sanctified. He belonged to the Lord, a child of God, but did not have a perfect heart. He was redeemed, but he was not internally purged and sanctified, not with a perfect heart. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, he went to battle and he overcame on that battlefield. It says, Now it came to pass after that a Messiah, they say, but not sanctified man, was come from the daughter of the Edomites, and the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the of the children of uh, Siam and search them to be his gods and he bowed down himself before them and he burnt incense unto them look at verse 15 in verse 15 it says wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah. 
you know, it's wonderful when you hear about salvation and you're saved. And then you hear about sanctification, the perfection of the heart, the purging of the heart. And you're sanctified. And the bench, the propensity towards doing evil and towards rebellion and disobedience, the Lord takes that propensity away. But Messiah, no. He did that which was right, but not with a perfect heart. And he went to battle. God gave him the victory. After getting the victory, he got all their idols. And he came to set those idols and gods in his own palace in Jerusalem. And he bowed down to those gods and he burnt incense unto them and the man of god came to him and said how could you do this the god that could not deliver their own people out of their hand look at verse 16 in verse 16 it says and it came to pass as the as um, and as he talked with him that he that the king said unto him and thou made of the king's counsel are you my counselor are you appointed to counsel me are you appointed to correct me to instruct me and then he said hold it then the prophet forbear and said i know that god has determined to destroy thee and he says because thou hast done this and hast not hacked unto my counsel that was a prodigal prince prodigal son prodigal prince prodigal king prodigal ruler prodigal shepherd and we come to Hosea chapter 4 in Hosea chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 4 Hosea chapter 4 verse 4 let yet let no man strive for or no reprove another for thy people are as they that strive with the priest with the preacher with the prophet look at verse 6 it says in verse 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and it said because thou hast rejected knowledge the knowledge of the right way the knowledge of the truth the knowledge of repentance and the knowledge of seeking after god after somebody has gone far away because you have rejected knowledge it says i will also reject thee that thou shalt be no more a priest a prince a king a preacher unto me seeing that thou has forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Look at verse 11 there. In verse 11, it says, Adam, wine, new wine, take away the heart. And that's what happened to Solomon. The women, the wine, the wisdom, the wells took away his heart. He could not follow after the Lord. And the Lord is telling us the story of this prodigal son and telling us the story of the prodigal shepherd. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the folly and the foolhardiness of prodigal, a prodigal prophet. It's, it's one thing to do something foolish. It's another thing to be foolhardy and to stick your neck there. I've chosen that wrong way and I'm going to remain in that wrong way. You were foolish at the beginning. Now you're foolhardy. It tells us in Jonah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 2. In Jonah it says, chapter 1 verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it for 
their wickedness is come before me. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, For Jonah rose uh, to, uh, up to flee, to flee unto Tashish. That's going to the far country. That's becoming prodigal. Why is such the hand of God cannot reach me here? Why is such the correction of God, the counsel of God, the counsel of the Almighty cannot reach me there? He fled unto Tashis from the presence of the Lord and went down to, uh, to uh, Joppa. And he goes on to say, and he found the sheep going to Tashis. So he paid the, the fear and then he tells us he paid the fear thereof and he went down into it to go with them unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. Anybody running away and fleeing from the presence of the Lord that's a pro prodigal person. That is a prodigal prophet. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, he tells us, But the Lord sent, look at that, not Satan, the Lord sent, not uh, adverse weather. The Lord sent, it's not an accidental thing because this is a prodigal prophet and it's going in the direction opposite to the calling of God. And the Lord sent out a great wind unto the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the sheep was like to be broken. What are we going to do? They sought, they cried to their gods, and eventually they discovered when they cast lot, the problem was Jonah. And what was he going to do? Prodigal prophet, what are you going to do now? Well, he's going to remain stubborn in his pursuit of the mirage of life. Look at verse 12. We're looking at verse 12. It says, And said unto them, Take me up, that's Jonah talking, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea become unto you for i know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you look at that he said instead of repenting instead of turning around instead of leaving that far country where he was going he pursued it and he said take me and cast me into the sea look at chapter 2 verse 7 in chapter 2 verse 7 it says when my soul fainted within me i remembered the lord and my prayer came in unto thee it says into thine holy temple look at verse 8 in verse 8 here is jonah confessing and saying they that observe lying vanities prodigal people they observe lying vanities an idea came to them the idea is vain a thought came to them that thought is vain an idea to go away from under the control and the counsel and the, and the comfort of the spirit that idea came is a vain idea and it says they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy look at verse uh, chapter 3 in chapter 3 reading there from verse 4 it said Jonah began to enter because the Lord had appeared unto him, the Lord said, Arise and go through to Nineveh and preach the same word I gave you before. So he began to enter into a city, a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown look at this uh, now in verse uh, in verse 8 it says in verse 8 but let man that the king of Nineveh let man and bees let them be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God and 
it says ye let them turn every one of them from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands of course Jonah was not expecting that he was not expecting that the king will repent his cabinet will repent and all the people where it will repent look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he will do unto them and he did it not chapter 4 now to see that although he went and outwardly is like okay god i've obeyed you now but his heart had not turned back unto the lord you see there is outward external obedience if that's why you send the whale to swallow me up okay i obey now but his heart was not like the heart of God. His heart was not perfect with God. His heart was not united with God. What God wanted, he didn't want. What God did, he didn't appreciate. Look at chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Look at verse 9. In verse 9, God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the God? Then he said, He said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Now you can tell his heart was not softened. Temporarily, the swallowing up of the prophet, prodigal prophet, made him sober, made him serious, made him to say, okay, God, I know that I've observed lying vanities, but now I want to obey you. And the Lord commanded the whale to drop him at the shore and came to him and gave him the assignment, the commission, the preaching again. But as they saw, you will see him telling the Lord, if you read chapter 4, this is what I thought in my country. When I ran away from you, and this is what you have done now, because you are a merciful God. But the man was angry. I pray that God will touch our hearts. That the Lord will turn our heart in the direction our hearts ought to go in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three is the faithlessness and the faith of prodigal people. Prodigal prince, prodigal prophet, prodigal people. We're looking at Psalm 73. We're looking at verse 27. In Psalm 73, verse 27, for lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. They that are far from thee, prodigal son, taking everything that he had and going to the far country. They that are far from thee shall perish. And he was about to perish with hunger in that place. Solomon, Saul, they that are far from thee shall perish an israelite an israeli king was not even supposed to marry one gentle wife he married one two a hundred five hundred seven hundred he was far from the word of god he was far from the desire of the lord he was far from what god had laid down for the children of israel they that are far from thee shall perish we're looking at proverbs chapter 14 reading from verse 12 in proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 there is a way which seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death look at verse 13 in verse 13 
even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. Uh, you know, uh, prodigal sons and prodigal daughters and prodigal kings, they know how to cover up the sorrow in the heart with laughter. The anguish in the heart with laughter. The regrets in the heart, they can cover it with laughter. How are you today? And they laugh hilariously. I'm always fine. But in the heart, they're suffering the judgment, they're suffering the punishment of being a far country prodigal son, prodigal daughter. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Isaiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 13. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Wherefore, my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Look at verse 14 there. In verse 14, wherefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth. And it says, and without measure. And it says, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and that make it rejoice that rejoiceth shall destroy the saint into it we're looking at jeremiah chapter 50 reading from verse 6 jeremiah chapter 50 we're looking at verse uh, verse 6 it says my people have been lost sheep my people beloved people Believing people, redeemed people, the people that you took interest in and brought them out of captivity. But now, because they've gone into the far country, prodigal people, it says, My people had been lost sheep. Their, their shepherds have, uh, have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains they have gone from mountain to hill they have forgotten their resting place welcome to point number three in point number three we're looking at the remarkable fervency and inheritance of proactive servants. We're looking at Luke chapter 15 and we're reading now from verse 18. He, he said, I will arise and go to my father. That's proactive. It's a proactive decision. This has happened but everything can be reversed. I came to the far country and I've seen now there is nothing profitable in that far country. And today, there are many people that will go into the far country. They, they're looking for greener pasture. They don't care. Any church there, <laughs> that's not my concern now. I want to get out of my African nation, African country. And whatever is happening there, whatever I read about happening in the far country, I want to go quick, quick. And if I cannot get visa directly there, I will go to another country as a stopover. And then there, I will work out a visa for myself. I must go to that far country. But you know, Everything is not green, it's not good in what looks like a far country. 
What if you get there and what you were expecting you didn't get? Well, I'll get there first. And this prodigal son saw that and saw the suffering that he couldn't ever think about. Sometimes it's the husband that goes to the far country. I'll go there and, you know, get this, get this, and then when I'm settled in a few weeks' time, a few months' time, look at my qualification. I'll call you, you'll come over. He's gone now for five years, six years. He's not able to settle there. He doesn't have enough uh, uh, papers there to reside and to stay. And the wife is over here. It may be the wife that, uh, that will say, well, my husband, let me go. At least, uh, you know, look at what I have. And this is what they're looking for in the far country. Have you prayed? You are talking about prayer. I've searched, I've looked at the internet and everything. And I know I can go. And uh, my husband, then the husband will take her to the airport. Bye bye. Few weeks' time, I'll see you again. Seven years pass. And she's not able to bring the husband to that place. Let's pray. Let's watch. Let's see. Before we plan and before we scatter our lives, it says the remarkable fervency and inheritance of proactive servants. It says in Luke chapter 15 verse 18, it says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. I have seen those three words can change a man's destiny, can change a man's heart, can change a man's poverty into prosperity, can change a wrong decision we have taken before and launch us in the promised land. I have seen and I will say unto my father I have seen against heaven and before thee I was told in verse 19 in verse 19 and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants verse 20 in verse 20 it says and he arose and he came to his father as i said before planning is different from performance the people that are always planning 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 i will i will i will do it i'm trying to sum up the courage i'm trying to get myself to do it they are planning, but they never perform. They have the intention. They never follow their intention, ways, action. But this man, he said, he, we are told he arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way of the father, I mean, looking through the window every time. Will he come back today? I know. Hunger will catch him. Will he come back today? I know. Circumstances will change and it will change his mind. Will he come back today? And the father had been looking through the window. He's coming. He's coming. He's desirous to have the prodigal son back home. That's the father had been waiting for us. And he says, I will stop. Jesus said, I will stop with you. He wants to fellowship with us. And when it was a great way of his father saw him and had compassion and ran and ran and ran. The father ran because of the eagerness in the heart. And let me, you know, say something about that running. You might, uh, you know, be old. Now, being old does not stop you running. If you have something in the heart, love in the heart, passion in the heart, and those sinners are perishing, and you see them in their multitudes, you see them in the day, you see them in the dream, you see them as they have festivals together, although your body might be old, but there's something in you, the love of God in you, the love for the sinners in you, the passion in you, the prayer, the intercession, will kind of energize your body, 
and you can run. And so the father, though much older than this, his son, the father saw him, he had compassion, and he ran, and he fed on his neck and kissed him. He came back home. I pray that all the prodigal sons and daughters, they come back home in Jesus' name. Whatever has happened, a lot might happen that a person cannot change. Look at that lady that went into the far country. I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. And she got to that far assembly, far from the word of God, far from doctrine, the doctrines of the Bible. And eventually, I want to marry you, I want to marry you. And that lady got married. And now, in that marriage, fire is burning from the man, from the in-laws, from the mother-in-law, from everybody. And she's saying, I wish I didn't, you know, run away like this. My prayer partner, who was not married at that time in deeper life, is married now. So and so, married now. But here I I am I got this one come back come back no, there's nothing God cannot change God can change that situation he can touch that husband that you got in the far country he can change that woman that you got in the far country the point is to take action and to come back and we're told the father kissed him we're looking at the three things here number one we're looking at the inheritance for the penitent from the father number two the implication of his promise for the faithful and number three is the importance of purity with fruitfulness number one we're looking at the inheritance for the penitent from the father uh, let, let, let's finish the story here we're looking at verse 21 of um, luke chapter 15 and the son said unto him father i have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and i am no more worthy to be called thy son when he was going out he was worthy this belongs to me i'm worthy of that and my father you cannot take this away from me i am your son give me the inheritance that i'm worthy of but now everything are dropped and he knew all that pride and self-centeredness of uh, the life of a runaway child that one is gone now i am not worthy look at verse 22 in verse 22 but the father said to his servants bring forth the best robe and put them put it on him and put a ring a ring of authority affirmation acceptance on his hand and shoes on his feet uh, you know in those days of slave trade the slaves living in the house of the master and the sons living in that same house they don't wear the same kind of dress and this son now wants to be a servant and the father said you're going to be a son bring the best robe and the servants of those time at the time of slave trade they never the master never buys shoes for them only the sons only the children in the family will have shoe but now he said make me a servant I'm not worthy to wear the shoe that belongs to sons. I'm not worthy to wear a good robe that belongs to the children in the family. And now, even though he asked for being a servant, a slave, the father accepted him fully as a son. As you come back, no matter your past, the Lord will accept you fully. There will be total inheritance, complete inheritance. And what servants, what slaves are not worthy of, 
the Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. And then we're told in verse 23, in verse 23, it says, And bring hither the fatted calf, like, you know, reserved for him, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Why? In verse 24, in verse 24, For this my son was dead, the fire away prodigal son was dead the one that led the father's home in the language of the new testament backslid dead the one that wandered away to dwell with the people who do not know god they are among the dead and they themselves are dead the one that got the fatal freedom the fatal independence dead it says for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and he began to be married look at number two here point number two here is talking about the implementation of his promise for the faithful and this is one he left the far country he said I will arise. He was faithful to that. I will go to my father. He was faithful to that. He planned to come back. He intended to come back. And in faithfulness, he didn't change. The people, they hear the word of God here. And the Lord points at everyone and pricks our heart and convicts us that this is the way. Walk in therein. And they say, yes, I will. Yes, I will. And they go out of that gate. They forget their intention. They forget their decision. They forget their plan. They do not put feet to their decision. But this one, he was faithful. And his faithfulness made God to implement the promise that God had made. We're looking at Jeremiah. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 32, reading from verse 38. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and uh, their children the good of them and the good of their children after them look at verse 40 in verse 40 and i will make an everlasting covenant with them that i will not turn away from them i will not turn away from them to do them good and i will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me the prodigal son did not go back to the far country god gave the heart that he will not depart again. He will not run again. These are not people that, you know, they fall, they come back. They run to a far country, far congregation, far church, far from sound doctrine. Then they come back, and then after again, they come back again. No, this man had the inheritance of the promise, the implementation of the promise to the faithful he was faithful and he abode he remained and what he promised i will go to the father and i will abide i will stay there he remained faithful i pray god will help everyone to be faithful look at number three number three we're looking at the importance of purity with fruitfulness here comes the elder brother very diligent, very loyal, very productive, laboring and hardworking. But, but, he didn't have the same heart for the father. The father was rejoicing. He was sad. When you are pure in heart, what rejoices the father's heart 
rejoices your own heart if the father is happy happy that this son had come back home the very fact that dad is happy you are happy but he had labor sweating walking without purity of heart there was no day he ever thought that let me go and search for my brother and bring him back home. no 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 his heart was not bringing back the younger son his heart was let him suffer there let him die there whatever happens to him good for him because that's the choice he made he didn't have purity with his labor he didn't have purity with his exaction of energy he didn't have purity of heart with walking 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 every day i've been walking with you and here your son did you say my brother has come back you know there are people that say they are serving god and they have a kind of attitude to the backslider that came back to the runaway daughter that came back and to the runaway um, um, former worker with us that came back and they have such hatred and they are watching whether the church will ever be so happy and to involve them in anything we are the people that bore, that bore the heat of the day and you are bringing this one back we have been here and we never lost any day of service from serving 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 where is the purity where is the love where is the compassion where is the mercy where is the heart of the father in the elder son and the father to go out and say my son don't talk like that this is your brother the father said your brother what he said not my brother your son what heart do we have do we accommodate those who are backsliding and their back does our facial expression show we want them back are we really laboring so that they will be back and feel at home that elder brother did not want that young man to feel at home are we saved are we sanctified are we pure are we passionate like god the father that's what god is wanting us to look at not just to read a story but to know that we must be pure that lord touch every heart transform every heart tonight and make you a happy loving compassionate merciful serving child of god daughter and son in jesus name may the favor of god be upon you may the love of god cover you may the inheritance of the saints be given unto you freely and may you have the heart of the father that will bring the lost sheep home, rescuing the perishing. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We've had a lot. Spend some time and pray.